Um, but yeah, nothing to say about the exam. We're writing it. It's going to be great. It's going to be it's going to be one for the ages. Um, let's see. So what we're going to do is keep talking about fluids. So we did most of it last week, really. We did the static parts and the buoyant forces and all that. But we've got to get to this dynamic thing. Fluid dynamics. Uh, already a question. <laughs> Why are we doing a review session for an exam? Because I don't want to. <laughs> so, uh, let the fluid flow. Fluid flow. Hafner's going off the rails. He's not nice anymore. I don't want to do it in a review session, so we're not going to. Um, so what we're going to do is dynamics. We're going to let the fluid flow. Who wants to win the Nobel Prize? I don't. That ship sailed a long time ago. My dreams are dead. But you might want to win the Nobel Prize, okay? And here is how you could win the Nobel Prize. If you see this candle. Oh, wait. We could do like a Schlierian projectomatic thing here. Oh. Oh, my God. This is spontaneous demonstration. Okay. I was supposed to blow it out and look at the smoke. Now, if I'd shut up, it would do what... Okay, oh, you see the laminar part? See how the flow is nice and smooth? If I stop talking. You see how the flow is nice and smooth and then suddenly becomes all crazy pants there? You see that? If you can explain how it goes, what happens there, Nobel Prize, right? This is complete classical physics. Let's see if it works with the smoke. <laughs> oh, you can't see the smoke, okay. Wait, that was keeping me warm. Um, <laughs> We're gonna relight this bad boy because literally my fingers, I can't write on the chalkboard. Um, but what we're talking about today isn't some quantum weird thing. It's just completely classical flow of completely classical material, but explaining things like how you go from the nice laminar smooth flow to the crazy turbulent flow, can't do it, right? We can't do it theoretically. Yes, we can simulate it on a computer and blah, 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 blah. But in terms of the basic, the basic physics of it, can't explain it. There's no simple way to explain exactly when it's going to go all crazy like that. Okay? So the point is, fluid flow, you would think, is just classical physics and easy. It's actually extremely complicated, extremely tricky. So what we're going to do is we're going to make three fundamental assumptions that will allow us, in our physics 125 mode, to understand fluid flow. One is we're going to make the Fusilli assumption and make it incompressible. Wait, no, that's, that's, that's pasta. What's the guy's name from Princess Bride? It's not Fusilli. Fitzini. What is it? Fitzini. Fitzini. That also sounds like pasta. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> so it's going to be incompressible. So we talked about that before. Gases are compressible, but liquids are incompressible. So it's going to be a liquid is what we're trying to say. Two, we're going to make it non-viscous, okay? So if we had, you know, a month to spend on fluids, we would get into viscosity. And we'll mention it briefly today, but we're not going to do viscosity problems. It's not in the book. So what that means is that there's no resistance to flow. It's basically frictionless. It's the, the fluids we're going to consider are incompressible and they're viscous. And three is laminar. And basically, that means it's steady and uniform. So that is this part of the little heat thing. The, the heat you saw in our shadow gram there, or the smoke that you could see if we could see it better. Okay? Now, okay. So it's very hard to do anything in the real world if you make all these, these sort of uh, things. So there's a very important video I want you to see that will inform the rest of your scientific career, no matter how short it may be. Um, let's see, here it is. This is like a great deal of my understanding of the world is based on this video. Okay, ready? Is it there, goodbye? No. No. Yeah, it is. I thought you said you're dead, but not bad. 
That is not my talk. Okay, thank you, yes. That is critical. Oh, there's that guy. Okay, that's my other one, but okay. I think I showed you that before, I don't know, okay? So this is serious, I'm not screwing around here, okay? So the innkeeper has a dog, Clouseau asked him, does your dog bite? Assuming it was the dog right there, the dog bit him because that wasn't his dog. So that's all about assumptions, okay? I'm very serious, read the scientific literature and they'll be like, a long time ago, someone made a bunch of assumptions on a theory and derived a simple equation. There's never simple equations that describe the universe. They're always super complicated equations we can't solve, like fluid flow. Okay, but if you make a bunch of assumptions, you can get this nice simple equation that everybody likes. And this guy in 1600 applied approximations and assumptions to get that simple equation. And people used it responsibly. And then somebody needed to get tenure, right? And they write a paper and they're like, well, shit, okay, I'm gonna use this equation. I'm not following the assumptions. And sometimes they'll do it knowingly and they'll say, you know, we're not under these assumptions, but let's just do it anyway, right? There's really, you know, what else can we do? Like, I'd actually prefer you do nothing, right? Then don't publish the paper. <laughs> but sometimes people just break the assumptions on purpose. Sometimes people don't know they're breaking the assumptions, right? They, they don't even know that there's assumptions behind this approximation, okay? So if you're ever doing research and you see a simple equation that describes a, an effect, I guarantee you there's at least 10 assumptions behind it. There are no, the only simple equation in the world that kind of works is F equals MA. After that, everything is complicated, okay? So you're gonna see in this lecture multiple times that there's like, we made these, we're breaking these assumptions over and over again, all right? It really happens. Okay, here we go. With that, I gotta be really crazy today to stay warm, okay? It's gonna be a lot of really fast movements. And apologies for the European stereotypes in that, uh, that video there, okay? So, so Clouseau is somewhat inspires my occasional French accent that comes out. It's a little bit of a Clouseau thing, okay. Okay, so we need some new laws. Let's, another thing I meant to write down is all this fluid stuff we're doing sounds very complicated. It is complicated, but the number of equations we're usually using is actually very small. The one you have so far is the pressure at some depth of a column, right, is the pressure at the top of the column plus rho gh, right? This is the static case. That's the one equation we pretty much did everything with the last time. That and definitions of density and volume and, you know. But the only physical law was pretty much that. So now we're really, today we're gonna to add two more. We're not gonna do that much. We're gonna use them in interesting ways. We're only gonna add two. Okay. The first one has a horrible name. Is the continuity equation. Okay. The continuity equation. Um, it's really a fancy way of saying the conservation of mass. That's really all it is. The conservation of incompressible mass. So I would say it like this. A, a bit of fluid, computer science people get excited, a bit of fluid remain, retains constant volume retains constant volume as it flows through a system. I can't write today. Through a system. That's it. Constant volume as it flows through a system. So let's see if what that, what formulas that gives us. Okay, so we've got, uh, let's have a system that's a little bit interesting. It's like a narrow pipe over here and then it expands to a wide pipe over here. Okay, my bar for interesting is not high, okay? Uh, the fun parts are over. Okay, here we go. So the narrow part of the tube has a cross-sectional area A1, right? So there's the narrow part of the tube there. And the wide part of the tube, oh, so much chalk, is A2. So clearly, A2 is bigger than A1. Hopefully you can see that. Right. Looks like we're at Home Depot buying PVC pipe for your high school something or other. Uh, let's see. So what we're saying is we got to look at some volume of fluid. Okay, so we're talking about volumes here. So let's say here the volume that goes past uh, um, A1 in delta T. Could we figure that out? 
Well, the volume would have to do with like the flow velocity, how fast we're flowing, right? Because we're doing fluid dynamics. So the velocity V is just how fast the liquid's going. So it's the same old V that you're used to thinking about. Okay, so we would say this fluid is going at V1, right? So in time T, the fluid that was here is going to make it to say here. In time delta T, it might make it to here. Okay, so here is your volume. The volume passed A1 and delta T. There's V1. This is like delta X1. And they all go together. You know, V is delta X over delta T, or delta X1 is V1 times delta T. So if you wanted the volume, then the volume 1 is what? It's just this area 1 times the delta X. So you could write it as area 1 times delta X1 or area 1 times V1 delta T. Either one. I forgot what I wanted to do to get started. I wanted to call it delta X. Okay. The volume of 1 is the area of 1 times delta X of 1. So all we're saying is it's flowing. If you go some distance delta X, some area A1, that's the volume. That's all we're saying. Okay. Now, what about over here? Over here, uh, let me give myself a little more room here. If it make it a little longer, put the A1 over there. Sorry, that's A2 now. All right. So here, the same volume that went here, it's the same volume that's going to move here. Right? So you can see it, it must be much shorter. It must go, it's got to have the same volume. So it's a much smaller little area we're going through here. Because on here, we would say in the same delta t, then it's also true uh, that you know, uh, we have v2 equals a2 delta x2. Right? So here, really short, is delta x2. And it's also at a different v. Right? It's not the same v. Okay, so no relationship between them yet. Okay, here it's flowing at one velocity, here it's flowing at another velocity. Here it'll cover uh, V1 in A1 delta X, here it'll go through V2 in A2 uh, delta X. Okay, um, but those happen, but to conserve, let's see, um, but uh, to conserve volume, those are in the same delta t. It's sort of how you would think about it, right? So you could divide both sides uh, by delta t, and you could see that a1 delta x1 over, uh, uh, or you just say sort of a1, let's not, delta x1, the volume you shoved in here has to come out there, equals a2 delta x2, right? Those are the same, right? Those volumes have to be the same. And they happen in the same delta t, so you could put the delta t under it. Because it kind of depends on what relations you want. Sometimes you want a relationship between the volume that changes, sometimes you want the velocity. So here we're thinking about the, the general laws about the velocity. So you can see delta x1 over delta t, that's v1. And delta x2 over delta t, that's v2. So you get the, the continuity equation is simply a1 v1 equals a2 v2. That's it. <clears throat> okay, so A is cross-sectional area and V is flow velocity. So that was an attempt at a geometric description. I think it sort of made sense. But now just think about it this way. Anywhere you go, it's got to have the same vol uh, amount of material flowing here that it has flowing here. Right? This is, what is this in? This is in meters per second. Meters squared times meters per second is meters cubed per second. This is basically a flow volume, a flow rate. Okay? Both of these equal Q, which is a flow rate. We don't use it much, but that's what it is. So you've got to have the same amount of material flowing here that you have flowing here. Because you've got to conserve mass, and because it's incompressible. The volume has to stay the same. So if the same amount of mass goes in here, it has to come out there. So now we have a second equation. That's it. A1, V1 equals A2, V2. That's all there is to that one. So this one is uh, continuity. A1, V1 equals A2, V2. As something flows. All right. Interesting, I say. 
You can have a demonstration of this, and I couldn't pull it together in time because stuff is happening. But if you ever see water flowing, right? So if you ever uh, um, have this case where you're looking at, like, just go to your sink tonight. Here's your sink, right? And the water comes out. And turn the sink down where it's nice and laminar, right? If you look at it when it's nice and laminar, you got to get real close. That's why I didn't really do it for you. As you can see, it actually is getting narrower before it breaks up into little drops. And the reason it's getting narrower is it's speeding up. Right? So here, gravity speeds it up, makes it fall faster. So therefore, if it's faster, let's see, if A1, V1 at the top is some value, that value has to equal A2, V2. Well, if V2 goes up, A has to go down. Right? So columns of water that are following actually do get narrower. It's a little hard to see, but it really does happen. Okay? So go look for that. Um, more of a problem, kind of a sort of a physics problem we can do with this is a hydraulic problem. So we'll probably give you one of these on the homework. I did get the homework started for those of you who are bored studying for the exam. I think I've only got four or five up there, and I put the due date next Thursday, because I'll almost certainly be behind because of the exam. So next Thursday is homework 10. Okay, so hydraulics. All right, there's just another example that we can do is basically fluid flow for mechanical control. So hydraulics lets you apply a large force uh, or let you apply a lot of work to something without having to apply a huge force. The one that you experience the most is your car, right? So most of you probably still drive these days, or does Lyft take everybody everywhere? All you, how many drive? Everybody drives, right? We all drive. Has anybody been driving when the hydraulics of their steering went out? Yeah, was it hard to steer? Yeah, you're like, oh my god! Hopefully you weren't going very fast, okay? But if, you're, if your hydraulics or your steering go out, you will realize it actually takes a lot of force to turn an automobile. You have to actually kind of lean on the wheel. Um, I don't know if that can happen anymore. I don't know if they even use hydraulics. I hope, yeah, they must. I don't know. Hopefully they have a better way coming soon because when the hydraulics go out, it's not pretty. Um, let's see. So let's draw something uh, hydraulic and let's keep it car related because I'm, you know, I'm just like a total gearhead, you know, like that. Let's keep the car stuff going here. Um, so what we do in hydraulics is we put a platform on the liquid. So at first we just have uh, the liquid here. La la la. So we're kind of at a hydrostatic problem again. Liquid. And we put a platform on here like this, a little solid object. Put a platform on here like that. So put platform on the liquid. Okay, that's going to make it somewhat useful. The liquid has some density rho, right? We've been using that a lot. And then we want to say how much force to do this. How much force to hold up a car, right? So we're going to draw it like this again. Let's see, this time it's going to look like this. And on this platform, we're going to sit... Right? Remember, there's actually liquid under there. There's no actual air in between. We're going to sit a car. When you draw a car, always draw the wheels first, because if you do, it comes out totally kick-ass like that. See, look at that. Always draw the wheels first. Um, and the car weighs 1,500 kilograms. Right? And we're going to see if we can use hydraulics to push down and lift the car. Okay, so we're going to have something, our finger holding it down here to where the difference in height is, uh, let's see, I don't know if I gave a number, um, uh, 1,500 kilograms, where's the height? Uh, 10 centimeters, All right, can we lift the car, this, I didn't draw this as 10 centimeters clearly, but can we lift the car uh, 10, no, millimeters, rho, g, h, oh my god, see I did this so de detailed. Oh, no, that, yeah, 10 centimeters. Sorry. Okay. That's the question is, what, what would it take to, to make that happen? What force would we have to push? 
to make that happen. Again, we have a density uh, rho. Let's see. Yeah, rho equals sort of like an oil is sort of 700 kilogram per meters cubed. It's kind of low, but that's the number I used. Okay. So look at that and say, um, I was thinking this had to do with the continuity equation. I don't know. And say, we've got to use a lot of our laws to do this, right? So one law is our static stuff. Remember, we can get the depth, the, the, the pressure at the depth in some column. But we can also have that rule that says, if I draw a dotted line across a continuous liquid, if I draw a dotted line across a continuous liquid here, then the pressure is the same all the way across the dotted line. All right, we've got to use that. Yeah, OK. So we're going to use that and say that the force on this area is equal to uh, the, the pressure we get here is equal to the pressure we get here. Because right? it's static, it's a continuous fluid, it's the same fluid, it's not moving. So let's look at this little plate here. And I forgot, I need the areas of these things. So this is a 4 by 2 meter platform. Just giving you some realistic numbers here. And this is a um, uh, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter platform. All right. There we go. So we'll start setting this up and see what happens, OK? OK, first, what is the pressure uh, here? OK, so this is where we're going to think. The fluid is doing nothing, right? The pressure there, well, it's like at no depth. So on the left, let's say the pressure is P atmosphere plus however hard we're pushing down. So in terms of strategies for solving problems, what I want you to realize is when we put something on a fluid and push, that's sort of part of the P naught. Remember? So P naught is this thing. So when it was just a fluid exposed to air, we called it P atmospheric pressure. When we sit something on there or we push, you just add that to the atmospheric pressure. OK? So FP over 0.01 meters squared. Right? The force per unit area. 0.1 times 0.1 is 0.01. See? We like to solve problems. Um, uh, can you explain that diagram? What is a square in the middle? Oh, this isn't a square in the middle. I was just showing you that uh, this is 10 centimeters. I was just telling you the height between the two. Right? That's h. I'm not sure what the number is. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> we'll get to it in a minute. OK? So on the left, so that's the pressure right here. Right? The weight of the, the fluid is doing nothing. That's just the pressure right there. Now let's go across. Do, 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 do. And then let's say it's the same as the pressure right here. OK? So that has to equal. Right, it has to equal this side. Okay. Now, what is the pressure right here? Oh, we go to this equation. It's the pressure at the top plus rho gh. What is that rectangular cutout? Yeah, I don't know. This, there's no rectangular cutout. Let's see. I don't know. I don't know what a cutout is. Okay. So the pressure on the right. Let's see if we can get it. The pressure here. Pressure at the top. P atmosphere. Plus, what does the car create? Its weight, 1,500 times 9.8 over its area, 8 meters squared, right? 4 times 2 is the platform. So those two together are rho naught. Rho naught. Or P naught, I'm sorry, not rho naught. All right. This is why we don't do problems. OK, it's too hard to keep up with problems. Uh, is h0 on the left? Uh, yeah, you could call it 0 if you want. Yeah, so it's, we call this 0. Right? All that matters is the difference. Right? Oh, yeah, so uh, rho gh on the The reason h is 0 on the left is we're not at any depth. Right? This is uh, rho gh or rho gd, how deep you are in the fluid. What's our depth in the fluid? Zero. So I didn't write that term. We're about to write it over here. Rho naught plus, here you go, 700, 9.8. That must be the part where I uh, said how deep it was. Yeah, 10 centimeters. Everything was 10 centimeters. Times 0.1. Right? 700 times 9.8 times 0.1. There's all the numbers. Right? 
all those numbers, you could plug in and see what it takes. Oh my God, a picture that's highlighted. I'm not on Snapchat. What the hell is this? You drew on it. I don't know how that works. Platform. What is this? This is just air here. I'm standing there. Okay. That's not anything. This is like a continuous fluid. Here's like a fish living bubbles. The fluid's here, and this is, yeah. There we go. There you go. Okay, so the area of this thing is 10 by 10 centimeters. We lifted it only 10 centimeters. And then you can see all these numbers we knew, except FP and the atmospheric pressure. We know that, but it's the same on both sides, right? The atmospheric pressure isn't going to make a difference. So now we're just down to the pressure we push here has to equal the pressure at the depth of that fluid there. Then why is the car higher than the person? Sorry, I'm lost. Uh, because I pushed down. See, FP, we push down, we hold the car up, all right? If you just let it sit here, and these roughly weigh the same, then these, these don't weigh anything. And we're pushed down this, we lifted this up. So we're just asking, how hard do we have to push to hold this up in the air? That's all we're asking. Right? Let's get the answer, and then I'll tell you why it's interesting. We have the answer. FP over 0.01 squared. This is all numbers, right? This is all numbers. So you could do the algebra, and you get 25 newtons. Oh my god. FP. We just lifted a car by pushing with 25 newtons. That's only 2.5 kilograms of weight. That's not much. I could hold 2.5 kilograms, okay? So we lifted a 1,500 kilogram car with the equivalent weight of 2.5 kilograms. So the way we did that is because fluid distributes the pressure. So whatever little pressure we apply here in this little area gets distributed over this huge area, and it lifts a car. That's how hydraulics works, okay? We can't gain energy doing this. We'll do next what happens, how much work you have to do. But that's, that's why you can turn your wheel when you drive and turn your whole car. Didn't, didn't it ever bother you when you're driving that I just turn this wheel and the whole car goes that way, like with one hand while you're looking at your phone? Didn't bother anyone? Oh, yeah, that's a physical intuition problem there. It's all from driving. Um, let's see. OK, so that's the amazing thing there. You're so blown away, you can, you're speechless. But now we didn't use continuity, did we? I could have done that last week. We just ran out of time. We haven't used continuity for anything. We did that whole problem with just static fluids, because it is a static fluid, right? Let's see. Yeah, that's the old message, OK. OK, so now apply. Continuity um, to lift the car one millimeter, uh, push down. How far do you think you're going to have to push down? One millimeter? No, that's because you're that's you don't think about what, what's happening when you're driving. Um, did you just say the fluid distributed the area? I said it distributed the pressure. Right, you applied a pressure here to the fluid. That same pressure was applied all over the place, and it was also applied here. Not the exact same pressure, because the weight of the fluid pulled it down a little bit. But this pressure was applied over this whole area, and then a somewhat smaller value was applied over that area. All right. OK. Let's see. OK, so now we're just going to use continuity to see uh, why this Damn it. Okay. Uh, okay. And we're going to use continuity to say what if we push down uh, the delta V over here, right on this side, say we push down is what? We push down uh, the area was 0.1 centimeters, I'm sorry, 0.1 meters times 0.1 meters. That was the area times how far down we pushed, call it D. And whatever we displaced here has to be what pushed up there, right? So that must be 4 meters by 2 meters, right? Because that's this area. And how much did we say? 1 millimeter. What would it take to push it up to lift the car? 1 millimeter, 10 to the minus 3 meters, right? Area times delta x, area times delta x. We're just saying those have to be equal. See? And the answer is something really big, 0.8 meters. So if you had this 
weird lift for a car, you could push with 25 newtons and lift a car, but you'd have to push almost a meter for it to go that much. Right? The car wouldn't move much. And that's how we avoid creating energy. Right? If you calculated the work you had to do to lift the car, it would come out the same. The work you do pushing this down equals the work it takes to lift the car that high. It's just a way of getting to do it with less force. Right? It's a mechanical advantage if you're going to be an engineer. There you go. So that's just the first example of the continuity equation. All we're saying is the volume that flowed down here is the same volume that flowed up there. Because area of volume equals volume. Area times delta x equals area times delta x. Okay? It gets weirder. But that's just a typical hydrophobic or hydraulic problem. So we're assuming the boards are only 2D. I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, let's see, where is the delta x from the right of the equation? Delta x is this. I lifted it one, you can't see it because the board won't stay up. I lifted it one millimeter. So that's delta x, that's one millimeter, 10 to the minus three. You gotta get fast with your scientific notation. Okay. All right, oh my god. 0.8. I got 0.8 when I did it. I am capable of mistake, highly unlikely. Okay. Okay. So in the, is it really that time or did somebody mess with a clock? No, it really is that time. Um, so we're going to do our third equation, and I'll just say the name so that you can start practicing saying it in your head, and then we'll do it. Uh, is the Bernoulli equation. Bernoulli. All right, let's just say what it is, and then we'll get excited for the derivation. What we're saying here is that the fluid conserves energy. So what have we done? We've done static. The continuity equation really was the conservation of mass, if it's incompressible. And now we're just going to apply conservation of energy and get a whole new equation that you can use in various cases. But let's do it in a minute. I don't want to do it right now. So five minutes. Doing the break early so I can warm up. Uh, OK, so now we've got to ask the question, uh, how are we going to apply conservation of energy um, to a fluid? So to quote Cal Drogo, these are questions for wise men with skinny arms. Right? <laughs> so one out of two. I got one out of two. Okay. Um, so what we've got to do is think back, how does conservation work? So I was watching it, and like when you first jump onto it with the Philo, it shows you the quotes, and then you can actually read what he said. I don't actually speak the language. Um, so we know this. If you have an isolated system, like a little bit of fluid, um, that's equal to delta K plus delta U. So here's good review for the exam, right? If you do external work and it's positive, and when is it positive? It's positive when you push along the displacement. You must be increasing energy. Right? If you do external work on something, you increase its energy. So one of these has to go, or the, the, the sum of these has to go up. You could have a case where you actually have kinetic decrease, like if you were to push it up a hill, but it slows down, but your potential is going to increase. Or you could have a case where potential actually decreases, but kinetic uh, increases enough to make up for it, but the point is, together they must increase. If this is positive, I'm just giving you a little word examples to think about. You could have negative external energy, that's where you catch something, in, or external work, where you catch something to slow it down. But the basic idea is if you do work on something, that'll go up. So all we gotta do, all we gotta do, is apply that to some fluid system. So let's do work external. First, let's calculate that. And our little imaginary fluid system is going to look something like this. It's like a tube with some small area down there, but not so small that you can't see what I'm doing. Here we go. A tube with some smaller area down here that goes up to a bigger area up here. And it also changes its height, such as to consider uh, gravitational potential. We're just doing gravitational potential. We're not going to have the fluid push on a spring. Ooh, that's a cool idea. I'll write that down. Fluid push on the spring. Excellent. <laughs> Final exam question. Okay. Okay, so what we want to think about is not really a little piece of fluid here displaces a piece of fluid here. We want to think about this whole piece of fluid right here in the thing. There we go. 
we're going to conserve mechanical energy for that piece of fluid. Okay? And now we want to think about the external work on it. So how are we doing work on it? Who's working on it? Like, it's just sitting there, right? Uh, the external work comes from the two pressures. So we have uh, pressure one over here, and we have pressure two over here, okay? And we're talking about the fluid flowing generally this way. So it's going at V1 over here, and it's going at V2 over here, okay? So fluid flows through a pipe, changes height, changes area. There's pressures. We don't know which one's higher yet. Don't worry about it. And uh, let's see. And we also have, do I need the area? I don't need the areas yet. That's all we need. Okay, so let's calculate the pressure, or the, the work. Here we go. Let's see. Um, work external. Well, what is work in general? It's force times displacement. Okay? So if we want to think about the work uh, that this side does, it's that pressure times that area, is that force, and the displacement we could just call uh, delta x, delta x1. Right? So we basically want to come up with little one subscripts for everything happening on the left. Okay? So it's pressure one. I think we're using the lowercase p's in this book. Pressure one um, uh, times the area of one um, times the delta x of one. Okay? So all these properties over here. It has a cross-sectional area of one. Um, in a dime delta t, we move it delta x of one. All these things are happening. Okay, let's see. Where's my phone? I generated a question already. Uh, yes. Are the heights equal on both sides? No. Right. <laughs> this one is higher. You meant you probably meant them in the diameters. No, the diameters are not necessarily equal. So this is a two, and it's bigger. I just didn't exaggerate it enough. Okay. Okay. So that's the work. So this one, this pressure, this fluid does external work because it's pushing it in the direction it moved, right? Positive pushed along the direction it moved. Pushed along motion. Now what about the other side? All right, so on the other side, which way is the force due to this pressure? It's this way. And it moves to the right. So that means it's negative, right? So I'm going to put a negative sign, minus, and then I'm going to say P2, um, A2. There's the force, delta X2, right? This is negative um, F against motion. So I just mechanically, I just put the negative sign in. If you want, we could do a dot product and blah, 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 blah. But we're trying to sign it just to get the ideas out, not do all the formal math, okay? Um, then we could say, well, area, so this area is from the force, and this delta x is from work, but then they go together, and you get that P1 V1 minus P2 V2 is the external work. All right? It's just PV minus PV. So we're going to stop there. So we have our external work term now. P1 V1 minus P2 V2. And it kind of makes sense. Here, you're, if the fluid is going forward like this, this pressure is adding to the energy. This pressure is reducing the energy because it's pushing the other way. Okay? This is like when you push the ball along this table. This is like when you catch the ball and stop it as it goes along the table. Okay? All right. So that is this term. Okay, we'll put that in in a minute. Now we've got to do the potential energy. Potential energy, the delta U, right? Okay, delta U. Here's a review for the exam. What is delta U equal to? Final minus initial. U final minus U initial. And if we're just talking about gravity, are we assuming the A's are equal? No, I just drew it horribly. I apologize. This one is bigger than this one. It's too late to redraw it. I can't. If I was on my computer, I'd just go, but I can't do that on here. <laughs> Um, I could tilt the... No, I couldn't do that. <laughs> okay, so U final universe. So these are uh, gravitational potentials. They're just MGHs. Okay? They're just MGHs. So it's really just MG, uh, Y... Let's see. Uh, well, what is... Uh, yeah. 
m g y one minus m. I'm sorry. The final is it's going to the right, so it's m g y two minus m g y one, right? Whatever the mass is, whatever the g is. So we're talking about uh, rho. So the mass is rho times v times g times y uh, two minus rho times v times g times y one. All right. So that's the delta u. Is how much some of the fluid gets lifted. It's really just how much you know. Whatever volume we're tracking, it goes from here up to here. And it's the total row, the total volume, or the total volume to get the total mass. Yeah, is V volume, yes. So row times volume is density. Mass, uh, density times volume is mass, sorry. It's mass, yeah. OK, well, that was it for potential. There's nothing else to, to write for potential. So we're done with that one. All right, and now let's do kinetic. We know that it's flowing. The velocities might be different, v1 and v2. We don't know if they're the same or different. We're not assuming anything. So we'll do kinetic now. All right, and we'll find that delta k is also final minus initial. So we'll get that delta k is 1 half mv squared, where this is the final mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. Right. How fast is some of it going? And then we say, well, those are, again, just rho v. Right? 1 half rho v v2 squared minus 1 half rho v v1 squared. How fast is it going when it's at the bottom and it's at the top? That's how much energy it gains. Right? Every little molecule goes through that and sees those different. So, so the reason I'm not doing subscripts on the volumes um, is because every molecule does this. Right? Every molecule goes from y1 to y2. Every molecule speeds up from v1 to v2. Oh, I gave it away. Or maybe it slows down, I forgot, I don't remember. OK, so now we put it all together. We have all three terms, delta k. Oh my god, do we really want to write it? Let's see, all together. I'm going to save us a little bit of writing, because this will just become a ridiculous mess. But we're going to say uh, this equals that uh, plus that. So what's going to cancel? Oh, shoot, nothing cancels. Um, oh, yeah, no, I remember now, yeah. Uh, so here we got to say, uh, as we go back, so I changed, I changed notation in the middle of the thing, is V1 equals V2 due to continuity equation. Okay. The same volume goes through. So you can actually write this. P1 V1 equals or minus P2 V2 minus P2 V. That's what I meant to do. That's the other reason you can say all these V1s equals V2s is just V. So if you put it all together, all the Vs cancel. That's the point. So I was going to write it without the Vs at least. All together, the volumes cancel. So that's one of those derivations. As you're going along, every step doesn't make sense, but the end kind of looks like it makes sense. If that helps. Okay, so the V's are all going to cancel. It's very exciting. What's going to happen? Um, what are we going to have here? Is we're going to have uh, P1, uh, P1 minus P2. Right, that's the left side once you cancel out the V's. Uh, because, so somebody's asking why is V1 equal V2, not A1 equals when the A's aren't equal. It, it's the volume that's conserved regardless of what A does. Right? The velocities in the areas are different, so that they're keeping the volumes equal. Because continuity says the volume is constant as you go through. So don't mix up the big V with the little Vs. Maybe you were thinking of velocity. Um, so this, uh, let's see, so now let's, that's equal to delta U, but let's get rid of the Vs. This is rho G Y2 minus rho G Y1. Right? And let's bring in the Vs, get rid of the Vs, and it's 1 half rho v2 squared minus 1 half rho v1 squared. All right. So you look at that and say, we're not going anywhere. This is a nightmare. All right. Let's separate them by side. But let's put 1 on the left, 
and 2 on the right. And then we'll see something kind of interesting. Right? We'll say, OK, the pressure of 1 plus its rho g y1, its potential energy, plus its 1 half rho v1 squared equals, on the other side, negative pressure comes over P2 plus rho g y2, rho g y2 plus 1 half rho v2 squared. And you look at this equation, and you say the left side, 1, is everything going on here, and the right side, 2, is everything going on here. It doesn't really care about the volume. The volume went away. It just cares about the pressure there, how high it is there, and how fast it's going there. That's all that matters. So it seems to me that there's this quantity that's constant. Okay? I could have put this other part right here, and we could have done it. Or I could have put it here, we could have done it. I could have put it here, and we done it. And you get a car. Okay? No matter where I put it, we get the same result. So this quantity we're looking at here on both sides is constant. It's a constant for the flow. All right, so we're going to put it right here. Bernoulli. So I'll put flow, because this is actually a liquid that's moving, is we say we know that the pressure right, plus rho, uh, rho gy, how high it is, plus the kinetic energy equals a constant. Shoot. Ah. Is a constant. <laughs> Anywhere you go in the fluid, you can say that's a constant. So that's how you solve problems just like how you solve hydrostatic problems. Remember, in hydrostatics, you draw this dotted line. And you say the pressure here equals the pressure here. Let me use this equation and say that's equal at both places. For flow, you say here's two places in this continuous flow. This here equals this here. And it don't have to be the same height anywhere. That's why it's a more complicated, exciting equation. Right, we're going to do a few examples. Okay. Um, so how to think about it. So remember how you did... Uh, energy, how you're doing right now in kinematics. All right, this is kind of what I just said, but I'm going to say it again. Energy in kinematics, what do you find? Do you find the initial and final? Right? The ball is up here on the ramp, it has some potential energy, and it slides down the ramp, and that converts to kinetic energy. And regardless of the shape of the ramp, if you just think about initial and final, you can get the velocity at the bottom. That's the whole exam right there. Um, but let's look at uh, energy and fluids, how this, more, how this works, which is Bernoulli. Right? So you would do it more like this. You'd say, I have this system where it's flowing in this weird way. Ooh, like that. Whoa, look at that. It's like a duck. Okay. So what you would do is ID two points. Instead of initial and final, is find two points. I uh, say you care about it here, and you care about it here, and say here. What if you had three points? Find in points, whatever it takes to solve your problem. I think we'll just need two for everything you're going to do. And the deal is, this is the same everywhere. P plus rho g h, or y, whatever you want to call it, how high it is, y, plus one half rho v squared, is the same at all your points. So that's how you use this information. Okay. Now, oh, the other thing is uh, the book will talk about streamlines, and that really just means always stay in the middle, right? So technically, if we started to say I'm going to put this point down at the bottom of the tube here and the top of the tube here, clearly that would get screwed up because then the height is wrong. So streamline just means that one little bit of fluid, what's it going to do? It's going to stay in the middle. So just do all your problems in the middle of the tube, and you'll be fine. Oops, stay in the middle. That's all a streamline is. So technically, I would want to put this one up here in the middle of the tube, not at the bottom. What does it say under energy kinematics, initial and final? I'm just reminding you how you do those problems. Kinematics is initial and final. Fluids is find to points and apply that equation. But they're both conservation of energy. OK. OK, it's about to get weird, OK? What was that term, streamline? That's correct, streamline. I'm not making fun of people, I'm just answering questions. Um, yeah, streamline means the little line where one little bit of fluid would go, and it's the place you want to put your one, twos, and threes. 
Just put it in the middle of the pipe. You can't go wrong. We're not going to get into what's happening at the edge of the pipe. We're just talking about the middle. Okay. Okay. Now you would think that this equations look kind of nice and everything is fine, right? We can go now, right? No. These equations are completely against your intuition, unless your intuition is really good or really messed up twice over. So I'd probably click on the latter, okay? So let's see. How do I want to say this? Let's see. Um, uh, okay, here's a crazy thing, right? Here is a tube, right? Here is a tube. I'm going to draw the actual thick walls of the tube to make it clear, to make this real. Okay, here is a tube. You have point one here and point two there, like we just said to do, right? But what's interesting is under our assumptions, um, to get flow, flow you don't need P1 to be greater than P2. What? Let's see, over here we have P1, over here we have pressure 2, over here the gas is flowing at V1, over here the gas is flowing at V2, over here we have area 2, over here we have area 1. Is there anything else? Let's see, I don't think so. What is that? Did I just get hyper? Oh, that's the 1. Okay. There we go. So your intuition says the only way that anything's going to flow down that pipe is if the pressure on the left side is higher, right? You're thinking of the real world. You're not thinking of the assumptions. Right? Under our assumptions, we assumed no loss. So Newton's uh, first law says the fluid keeps going. Okay? So you could ask, well, if there's no pressure difference, why is it flowing in the first place? And the answer is, something back here made it flow, okay? When you calculate pressure differences for the homework assignments we're going to give you, the pressure difference you're calculating is not responsible for the flow. We're just saying there is a flow. Some compressor over here made a flow, okay? And we can show you. Let's do this homework problem right now. Let's see. Uh, what is delta P? Oh, well, let's do it. Uh, let's apply this crazy equation here. Well, we have position one and we have position two. At position one, what do we start with? P, okay? P1 plus rho GY1, how high it is, okay? Plus one half rho V1 squared, how fast it's going. Fine, okay? That must be the same on the other side. P2 plus rho GY2, right? Rho G uh, Y2 um, plus one half rho V2 squared. Okay? So you'd say these are the same. Y1 equals Y2, same these. Okay. All right, those are the same, so they go away. Okay? Now you'd think, oh, well, you're wrong. The pressure's going to be different because the velocities can, could be different. But can the velocities be different? No, continuity, ah, continuity says A1 V1 equals A2 V2. And the way I drew it, A1 and A2 are the same. Ah, so A1 equals A2 equals A, so V1 equals V2. Right? You can't just arbitrarily have it speed up and slow down because of continuity of the volume. Right? So those velocities are equal. Sorry, oh my god, i got to stick to my cursive, oh, those are velocities. All right, area, oh my god, this is, area times volume is nothing. I forgot that I have two Vs going here. There we go. Okay, so those velocities are equal. What does that mean? Those are the same. So we get P1 equals P2. Okay. So under our ridiculous assumptions, liquid can flow down this tube. Something out here got it going, and it's just like a mass on a frictionless table. It just flows through the tube because we didn't let there be any friction. Right? That's all it is. This is 1D kinematics. Conservation momentum is all that is. 
So you say, okay, well, fine. <laughs> uh, why is that interesting? I forgot. Okay. Okay, this is the really non-intuitive. Okay, so one thing that's a little unintuitive is you think you need a pressure difference. That's because you're used to thinking about viscosity and loss, but you don't under our simple assumptions. Let's look at something even more, a little bit strange. So I'm trying to give you these so that when you're doing the homework, your intuition won't lead you astray, okay? Gotta make sure I get to the big point, though. Okay, let's have liquid flow through a Venturi tube. That's this thing you'll see in the book. And we're going to do some things the book does, and we're not going to do some others because it makes me very upset. Okay, so let's just look at the Venturi tube first. Here we go. It typically looks like this. You've got a big area over here, and it necks down to a small area over there, like that. All right? Okay, that's exciting. So this is one. It has a cross-sectional area. A1, there's pressure one over here. It's flowing at V1 over here. All right, so what we were saying we have flow this way. This is A2, it's at pressure two, and we have V2, okay? So we just wanna know what's going on. Right? So we wanna say, where's the pressure higher, et cetera. So first let's say, which is faster? One or, oh, let's see, which region is faster? Which region is faster? Hmm. Uh, let's see, for that I would use continuity. A1, V1 equals A2, V2, right? A1, V1 equals A2, V2. Uh, I'd say, well then let's solve for, oh I don't know, V2. V2 is A1 over A2, V1. A1 over A2, is that a big number or a little number? a big number. Um, so V2 is faster. And I think that part you're okay with. You could visualize that, right? If I have some fluid going into this thing, it has to squeeze down to there. Oh my God, it goes really fast, right? That's perfectly intuitive. Okay, fine. Uh, where is the pressure lower? It's not. Is pressure lower? Where's the pressure level? Right. Think about videos you've seen the little blood flowing through the capillaries, right? It goes real fast through the capillaries when it doesn't go so f fast through here. But where's the pressure lower? Which side? Try your intuition. See if you can figure out which side the pressure is lower. Um, well, now we want to go to uh, Bernoulli's flow law, right? And just say, I don't know, let's just apply the flow law, see what happens, okay? Here's our slipstream, no, no. Our jet stream? No. Our, our streamline. Thank you. I don't use that term very much. Okay. Okay, so we're going to take this side and say P1 plus rho GY1 plus one half rho V1 squared. Sometimes I tell people don't think. Okay. Don't think on these. Just apply this in two places. Don't think about it until you're done writing it down. Just don't even look over there. P1 plus Y, okay. Now this side, don't think. P2, don't think. Rho, G, how high is it? Y2, oh my God. Plus one half rho, how wow, fast is it going? V2, done, okay, don't think about it. Okay, <laughs> that's how you do these problems. Um, now you gotta think about it. Say, okay, can anything go away? The potential term can go away, right? They're at the same height. I didn't draw any height difference in these two things. Uh, y1 equals y2, same. They're not zero, they're the same, right? So that makes them go away. Cool. Um, what are we gonna do with what's left? What are we gonna do with what's left? Any relationships between what's left? Ah, the velocities, right? So we could say uh, pressure at one plus one half rho V1 squared is the pressure at two plus one half rho V2 squared. We could wrap V2 in terms of V1. Look, I happen to have done it up here. It's almost like I planned that or something. A1 over A2, I actually didn't because I don't really plan these ahead, squared V1 squared, 
right? Like that. Interesting. How are the y's the same? So, so, so make it clear, I didn't explain this super clear, is these are from potential energy, mgh. So we're just saying, let's say this is y equals 0. Or let's say y equals the ground is down here. y equals 0, then this is y equals, say, 2 meters. But this one is also 2 meters. So rho g 2 meters, rho g 2 meters. It's the same on each side. Okay? Or you could call it 0 if you wanted to. That's because I drew it horizontal. Yeah. OK, so we look at this thing and say, are the pressures the same? Instead of getting into a bunch of algebra, let's just look at it here. This is some constant value, isn't it? It's some value. It's like what we say here. This thing has to be a constant. So there's your constant. Now what is this side going to do? A1 over A2 is a big number, right? A1 over A2. Um, Right, so this is bigger. So what does this have to be? Smaller. Wah, 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 wah. Right, so this is small pressure. And this is high pressure. What? Perfect. I love it. Somebody went, what? Not just me. Somebody else did it. Yeah. So when the flow goes into the narrow opening, the pressure goes down. For real, it actually does. And the reason is, so the reason that's counterintuitive is you're thinking of a gas. Okay, yeah, so, and the relief. This is, I'm gonna get emotional. Okay, so if you were to blow gas into this, yeah, you would compress the gas and make the pressure go up because you're forcing it into this little volume. But this is a liquid. It's an incompressible liquid, okay? All it can do is keep the same volume and here it flows faster. Now, why does the pressure have to be less because it flows faster? Yeah, I don't know. I can't answer that. Oh, there's just, it's because of Bernoulli's equation. No. Uh, the real reason, if you really wanted to get it real deep, is you think about the work the pressure is doing on it. Ooh, and you have to conserve energy, so it's speeding up. Oh, it's gaining kinetics, so there must be some negative work done on it, so the pressure differential must change in the right way. So you could get there. It's not worth it. Okay. Um, I can prove this to you, sort of, but I'm going to break my own rule. Okay, now... What upsets me greatly in these problems, okay, good. What upsets me greatly in these problems is then your stupid book will say, let's put a tube on here, and let's put a manometer, and let's look at how the pressure is different on the two sides. You can't do that. You can't do that. Why can't you do that? What rule have we broken here? Because then they're doing, oh, well, it's a gas, and then this is a fluid, this is a liquid down here. But we just said you can't do this with a gas. It has to be incompressible. So you're not going to get any problems with any stupid Venturi tubes and fluids and all that bullshit. Right? Your problems will be all liquid, okay? But now for a demonstration, I will do it with air, okay? <laughs> so, the, so these rules do kind of slightly uh, occur with air. It's, the reason they do that is air is compressible, but a lot of the laws come out similar, okay? But quantitatively, they don't come out correct at all, okay? But it bothers me that they make these assumptions at the beginning of the chapter, and then they give you homework where they totally break them with air. But the one way we can demonstrate it with air is this. So ping pong ball in a very old thing with a very old thing here. I have not had a tetanus shot since I was 18, but this is probably going to work out. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow the ping pong ball out of the uh, cone or out of the funnel. Okay, I didn't blow hard enough. Okay, I've got to sneak up on it. You ready? Watch this. Okay, that doesn't work. You can even, like, if you want to get a free point, right? So watch this. Here we go. Okay. What's happening here? How, why, why won't it fall out? But because if you think about the pressure, this is proof that the pressure goes the right... Oh, my God. Goes the right way, right? So you have your thingy here like this, and the gas flows very fast right here. So the pressure goes down, right? Wherever the gas flows fast, the pressure goes down. Here you have atmospheric pressure. So the net force, you can imagine, is down. And the little buzzing is it tries to go up and immediately gets pushed back down by the atmosphere. It'll never come out. If you want tetanus, you can come to this too. And my candle's done. So this is the new way we measure the length of a lecture. Here we go. So, okay, so I'll see you Thursday.